Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another exciting installation of our monthly seminar series. Today we, today we have the highly acclaimed Professor Timothy Rebeck to give a webinar on cancer genomics. Now, to give a bit of background to who he is, um, Dr. Rebeck is the Vincent Gregory Professor in Cancer Prevention at the Harvard Chen School of Public Health and Professor of Medical Oncology at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Rebeck's research focuses on etiology and prevention of cancer with an emphasis on cancers with a genetic etiology and those that are associated with disparities in incidence or mortality by race. He has directed multiple large molecular epi epidemiologic studies and international consortia that have been used to identify and characterize genes involved in cancer etiology, understanding the relationship of allelic variation with biochemical or physiological traits, exploring interactions of inherited and somatic genetic variation with epidemiological risk factors. His research also focuses on the roles of biological and social factors on prostate cancer disparities and prostate cancer in Africa through the men of African descent and carcinoma of the prostate, MADCAP consortium. He has also led a number of consortia that study carriers of BRCA1 and or BRCA2 mutations to understand breast, ovarian, and prostate, prostate cancer risk and precision prevention interventions that may reduce that risk. In addition to his research activities, Dr. Rebeck leads a number of initiatives on the Harvard campus. He serves as an associate director for the equity and engagement in the Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center and co-director for the collective impact program of Harvard Catalyst. In this role, he prioritizes the cancer research agenda to maximize disease prevention and risk reduction in Massachusetts. He also oversees a team of charge <clears throat> charged with ensuring that this research engages with and positively impacts communities with the greatest disease burden. As Director of Global Oncology at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, Dr. Rebeck oversees formal and informal training and research partnerships between Dana Farber investigators and trainees with international partners. I could go on reading this illustrious CV, but for the sake of time, I'm going to ask everyone who is atten attending the webinar to join their hands or the screen, just wherever you are, just welcome Professor Rebeck for the Cancer Genomics What Can You Learn From Africa talk. Thank you so much, Professor, for agreeing to give this talk. Great, thank you for having me. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'll take that as a yes. Uh, I am really pleased to be here to give this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to necessarily answer questions during the presentation if I can't see people's hands raised, but we'll certainly have time at the end uh, for questions. So please uh, think about what you would, um, questions you have for me. Uh, I'd like to spend a little time today giving you some philosophy that I've been thinking about on uh, genetics and genomics in Africa and what kind of contributions, what we can learn from Africa. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about that and then I'm going to give you two uh, vignettes of data that um, we have that represent sort of kinds of uh, things that we can learn from Africa and why doing this kind of work in Africa is important. Um, so let me just start by, um, hmm, that went, my thing went away, okay, and let me try again. So let me just uh, talk to you a little bit about cancer and why cancer and other uh, non-communicable diseases are very important. One slide on this. Um, it's very well known now from uh, data th from the WHO and IARC that cancer is a major problem uh, in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we anticipate about uh, 650 to 700 uh, uh, thousand deaths from cancer uh, this around now, and that we expect that this uh, cancer death rate will approximately double. So we expect about uh, 1.2 million Africans will die of cancer by 2035. Uh, and we already, based on um, statistics from the World Malaria Report as well as the WHO, uh, believe that there are more Africans that die of cancer every year now than, uh, than die from malaria. 
So we're facing this very difficult burden, uh, dual burden, where malaria and other infectious diseases are incredibly important in Africa, but chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases are becoming quite important as well. So why can genomics and genetics begin to help us in thinking about this disease burden? What can we learn um, in order to address these problems? I want to start up front by saying uh, genetics is, and genomics are a piece of the problem. I, I don't want anyone to think that uh, by understanding cancer genetics or genomics, we can solve the entire problem of the non-communicable disease burden in Africa. Of course, uh, healthcare systems, patterns of care, uh, epidemiological and other exposures and risk factors are critically important. Uh, social and behavioral uh, and policy decisions are also critically important too. But one piece of this problem can uh, be addressed through uh, our understanding of the basic underlying biology of, uh, of cancer uh, through genomics, through other biomarkers. So I think one of the things, hmm, uh, so one of the things that we um, think we can learn from Africa uh, are that there are unique variations in risk and phenotype. So for example, I'll give you the example of prostate cancer in a moment. Prostate cancer tends to be diagnosed at a very late aggressive stage, usually in lethal form in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and this is something that is of great interest. This phenotype is a, aggressive cancer is of great interest to the world because that's the uh, type of uh, cancer that we really care about. Who is going to die of cancer? Who's going to have an aggressive phenotype? And African, the African setting allows us to understand the risk and the phenotypes of aggressive disease. Similarly, there's unique disease etiology and natural history. So for example, uh, there is limited screening limited early detection. Uh, and while in the, uh, Europe, North America, Australia, other places, we have uh, a great deal of intervention uh, through early detection uh, for some of the more important cancers, which don't really occur in Africa. So it gives us the opportunity in Africa to understand the complete natural history of these uh, cancers. But obviously, our goal is to be able to identify um, interventions, screening tools, early detection tools that will allow us to intercept uh, cancer before it becomes aggressive, both in Africa and in the rest of the world. And finally, um, a, Af the African diaspora uh, presents some interesting opportunities and challenges for our understanding of cancer and other non-communicable diseases. So the um, rates of prostate cancer, and particularly aggressive prostate cancer, breast cancer, and many other cancers in African-Americans uh, and Afro-Caribbean populations are incredibly high. And for us to be able to understand that and to understand why individuals with African ancestry are uh, having experiencing such disparities and such important problems uh, with their uh, cancer risk and prognosis, uh, our ability to use the African diaspora from Africa to North America and Europe and other places uh, to understand natural history, the underlying biological basis of these diseases is really a great opportunity. Hmm. For some reason, my uh, screen is not uh, doing its thing. Sorry. So um, why would we want to do this kind of studies in Africa? Well, the things I just told you are certainly um, uh, good uh, biological and mechanistic bases for understanding what's going on with cancer in Africa. But I think that cancer in Africa and cancer genomics can also provide a, uh, an opportunity uh, for developing science, scientific infrastructure, training, and, and um, knowledge in Africa. So I think that our ability to do some of this work will allow the development and implementation of new technologies uh, on the African continent. These new technologies, our ability to do uh, uh, genome sequencing, gene, uh, biomarker uh, development, the research infrastructure that it takes to do human-based studies can be great social and economic drivers and disruptors uh, of the uh, of certain kinds of uh, economic patterns that will really bring the uh, at sub Saharan Africa up uh, in its ability to do work to do to build economic and intellectual capacity. Certainly, I live in Boston, 
the fact that Boston is a home for uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the biotech industry, and has great acad uh, academic institutions is a major economic driver in Boston. I think the same kind of economic drive uh, can be achieved in Africa where we build uh, pharmaceutical, biotech, academic uh, partnerships uh, in, 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 and intellectual capacity uh, to do all kinds of great things that bring up both not only academics but social and economic status as well. Uh, this kind of activity can foster innovation and investment in various places. It can stem brain drain. We have known, noticed from our uh, own uh, consortia and that I'll talk to you about in a minute that individuals who have academic and intellectual outputs and the ability to do work in their home places um, are less likely to uh, want to go to Europe or to North America and stay there. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of opportunities that are brought for smart, hardworking, motivated people uh, to stay in Africa when they have those opportunities. Um, they, we also have the need to address the unique biological features and phenotypes of cancer in Africans. As I mentioned, these phenotypes and features are very unique and we not, can't necessarily rely on the, uh, the treatment protocols, the risk protocols and patterns that we see that are developed among uh, European descent populations in Europe or North America to understand completely how we will uh, impact on the uh, unique biology or the unique phenotypes in Africans. Uh, so we need to do studies in Africa to understand the unique needs and address the unique needs in Africa. And finally, as many of you know, the uh, ability to do cancer genomics and other uh, molecular and uh, basic science kind of tools is becoming increasingly feasible due to lower costs and accessibility of these technologies. And in fact, in our consortia that I'll talk to you about in a minute, we're only doing our genomics uh, work, our biobanking work, et cetera, in Africa. None of the samples, the data, et cetera, come back to the United States uh, because we're really able to do pretty much everything we need to uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, try to. So um, the first in, uh, example that I'd like to give you um, is in prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer has the highest heritability of any major cancer, and in fact, the uh, our ability to identify risk factors for prostate cancer has been extremely limited. Uh, in contrast, there's been a lot of genetics of prostate cancer, and so we think that there's a major contribution of genetics to prostate cancer, and we'd like to understand better how the genetic contribution in African populations or from in African individuals uh, is impacting on risk. And the second example I'm going to show you is of um, BRCA1 and 2, the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, susceptibility genes. Uh, so BRCA1 and 2 are really good examples of how you can take knowledge of genetics and, and translate it into clinically significant uh, as a setting where we can get, um, uh, sorry, where we can get uh, clinically actionable uh, results. So let me start by talking about our prostate cancer work. So we're, I'm going to use the uh, MADCAP, or Men of African Descent and Carcinoma of the Prostate Network, that we've um, uh, been uh, developing over the last 15 years. This includes uh, consortia members uh, from across Africa. Uh, a number of those are now NIH funded, that is, they have their own NIH grants and subcontracts in uh, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, and uh, South Africa, but we also have centers that are building up in uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Rwanda, Botswana, uh, and a number of other places. So we have a, a pretty strong network with common protocols and common approaches that we've been uh, developing in, to col collaborate with a series of institutions in North America to do uh, genomics. And I'd just like to give you one data vignette that we've been doing, uh, that we've recently published uh, in Cancer Research. This is um, uh, work large, led by uh, Joe Lachance, who was a postdoc with me uh, and is now at uh, Georgia Tech uh, in, in, in Atlanta. Uh, and what we wanted to do here is to understand the nature of genetic susceptibility to prostate cancer that's been identified by genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. So what we did is we, we asked about 26 or uh, uh, prostate cancer GWAS studies, including 68 independent SNPs uh, with known risk frequencies and odds ratios that have been reported in the literature. So this isn't all of the uh, GWAS hits that have been identified, but this is 
uh, a, a reasonable subset. And importantly, these 68 independent SNPs were found uh, are really incontrovertible prostate cancer susceptibility loci, but all of them have been identified through uh, European or Asian populations. None of these that we studied have been identified through African or African-American populations, although some of them have been replicated in African-American populations. And so we've used this uh, prostate cancer GWAS to uh, combine with data from the Thousand Genomes Project with 26 global populations and um, uh, with data from Sarah Tishkoff's lab at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, sequencing data from 38 African populations. So we had about a million genotyped SNPs um, with these, uh, these 68 independent loci uh, for prostate cancer. And we did a number of different uh, things to try to understand the underlying nature of these GWAS uh, SNPs and what their role is uh, in prostate cancer in broader comp population contexts, not just in those populations in which they were identified, largely European or Asian populations. So let me walk through um, a couple of the results that we found. Um, and I'm going to just give you some a very, uh, I'm not going to be able to go through every single SNP, but what I thought I would do is walk you through the example of uh, one SNP, RS7584330, which is a, a, a locus, a, pro a prostate cancer locus identified on chromosome 2. There's not much around it that we can say is a risk locus uh, of gene that, that we can biologically explain why the, um, this locus is associated with prostate cancer. Um, so we have a lot to learn about what's going on with this locus. So on this first slide, we have on the um, y-axis all of the 68 SNPs we studied, and again, the one that I'm going to sort of walk you through, 7584330 up here. On the, on the x-axis, we have all of the different populations that we studied. And the first thing that we did is just ask what were the frequencies of the risk alleles for these uh, 68 SNPs across different populations. And the first thing that you can see is that there are some populations that have greater risk of prostate cancer. We, know, we uh, infer this from uh, population-based um, uh, registry information about risk of prostate cancer. So there are higher uh, risk of prostate cancer in some populations on the right-hand side that are lower risk of prostate cancer. And then we also have SNPs that are associated with increased risk of in, um, in, in, in uh, prostate cancer in Africans, so they're sorted and uh, SNPs that are associated with prostate cancer risk in non-Africans. So you can see there's a pattern here. Up in the upper left-hand quadrant, there are some SNPs that appear in higher frequency in populations uh, with greater risk of prostate cancer. So there's some of those, and there are also some populations that have uh, SNPs at in higher frequency in lower risk populations. So there are some patterns that suggest um, uh, associations uh, of frequency with population, uh, populations at different risk of prostate cancer. We also computed some population uh, evolu uh, genetics and evolutionary uh, 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 quantities to understand something about the relationship of these uh, SNP, prostate cancer risk SNPs. And so this slide shows you um, uh, the relationship between uh, the FST, so the uh, uh, di differences among populations, and on the y-axis, um, we have the differences between African and non-African populations, so African versus European. And on the x-axis, we're comparing the FST values um, with, between uh, uh, West and East African populations. So the, you can see in the light blue dots are all of the million SNPs that we had in our study. And you can see on the upper right-hand quadrant, there are some uh, SNPs that are very different in terms of allele frequency between both Africa and Europe and between uh, West and East Africa. The black dots are the prostate cancer loci that we studied. So these are the prostate cancer SNPs, the 68 loci. You can see most of them have very similar frequencies, very similar patterns uh, in both Europe and North, uh, Africa as well as West and East Africa. But there are a couple of SNPs that are showing up as having very different uh, patterns in uh, Europe versus North America. And here circled in the red is our SNP of interest, um, RS7584330. So the first piece of information here is that there is some suggestion that this SNP has uh, gone, undergone some kind of change in its frequency um, between uh, uh, Europe and Africa. And there are some other SNPs with a little bit higher 
uh, differences there too, as well as some that differ between at West and East Africa. So some in, in indication that there is something going on between African and uh, European or West and East Africa for some of these SNPs. So what might that mean? Well, here are two slides that uh, discuss uh, cross-population comparisons. So the slide, the panel on the left, uh, shows just all of the different uh, SNPs that we've identified from GWAS, the 68 uh, different SNPs. And up here near the top is our SNP of interest, uh, 7584330. Um, it got, got a little bit misaligned. It's right there, that SNP of interest. And what we did is we computed a genetic disparity contribution. We just, uh, without going into detail about the, the quantitative, the statistical method we used, we weighted the frequency of the alleles versus the risk associated with these alleles and got some sense of um, how different the populations are and how different the uh, contribution of each of these SNPs to prostate cancer is between Africa and Europe. So up on the top, in the blue bars, we have some metric of the contribution of a SNP to uh, a risk of prostate cancer in Africa, all predicted based on sort of published data that we can access. Um, so there are some SNPs that, have, that suggest they contribute substantially to um, prostate cancer risk in Africa, and some SNPs down in the bottom in the gray bars that suggest they are giving much greater risk of prostate cancer in Europe. So again, this is just one metric, but what it tells us is there that the genetic contribution to prostate cancer uh, by specific SNPs may not be equal in all populations. There might be some SNPs that contribute substan more substantially to European prostate cancer and other SNPs that might contribute more substantially to African or African descent prostate cancer. All of these are prostate cancer SNPs, so it's not that we don't know whether, um, because we haven't validated these GWAS in all populations, we don't know necessarily whether all of them, say, in um, these uh, European SNPs actually have an, a measurable impact in Africa. Um, but we assume that they're all underlying the same biology and so that they are all prostate cancer loci. But we, we think that some may contribute more to some populations' risk than others. In panel B, on the right-hand side, we also have um, the same, a similar kind of contribution where we've computed genetic risk by population. So the, the, uh, on the left-hand side are all of the different populations on which we have data. And we computed a score saying, based on the genetics that we see, the frequency of alleles uh, that, are, that we have available, et cetera, for these risk prostate cancer risk loci, which populations would be predicted to have the highest prostate cancer risk. So you can see that um, we have a series of different scores for all populations. Uh, the black uh, 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 values are for West Africans, the blue values are for East Africans, and the gray values are for non-Africans. So just based on these predictions, we would pr uh, uh, hypothesize that in West Africa, the genetic contribution to prostate cancer risk is the greatest. It's a little bit lower uh, or similar in East Africans, although there are some East African populations that have relatively low risk, and that non-African populations, particularly Northeast Asian populations, have the lowest risk of prostate cancer genomically. So we're beginning to put together a picture that there are some loci that contribute more, and because of that, some populations that are more likely to be at elevated uh, prostate cancer risk. And this is very similar or com compatible with data that we've seen in other studies. So this is, for example, a study that was published a few years ago by NCI uh, and Singh's group who published a prevalence study in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Ghanaians in particular. And what they compared is populations in uh, a population in Ghana, in Accra, which had a very high rate of prevalent prostate cancer. They did this by uh, screening the population, identifying individuals who were at high risk, and then doing biopsies in them to figure out what the prevalence of prostate cancer was. This same kind of study design was also done among African Americans in the United States and has been done a number of times in Caucasians in the United States. And similar to what I just showed you in that right-hand panel, we do see that a West African population, Ghanaians, have very extremely high risk or high prevalence of prostate cancer 
African Americans have variable but lower risk of or prevalence of prostate cancer, and Caucasians in the United States have an even lower uh, prevalence of prostate cancer. And there are studies in Asia that suggest an even lower rate. So what we've shown by our genetic prediction is consistent with some of the epidemiological data that say that West Africans have among the highest rates of prostate cancer predicted uh, based on their genomic profiles. We also uh, are, began to wonder, well, what is going on um, with these different frequencies, the different uh, relative genetic contributions to risk uh, with these known GWAS hits? And so we did a, 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 an evaluation for scans of positive selection across the genome. And again, uh, the blue dots are all of the million SNPs that we have. And as you can see, some uh, of the blue dots have extremely, are under extreme selection in Europeans up here on the upper left-hand quadrant. Some are under extreme selection in uh, Africa uh, on the lower right-hand quadrant. Some are under selection in both places. Most of them are not under selection at all or under very small amounts of selection. Um, and the, uh, uh, so the, the black dots being our GWAS hits that we're interested in. But again, our gene, uh, our SNP uh, of interest, RS758430, has undergone some pretty substantial uh, selection. Uh, and that selection appears to have under, uh, been uh, happening in European populations. So there's um, a difference based on what we've seen so far, a difference in the frequency of alleles between, uh, at this locus between Africa and Europe. Um, and there's some evidence that the reason for that difference of, 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 uh, is due to selection that occurred in Europeans. And so this is a, just a little bit of a breakdown. This is 7584330. Um, and there are three local um, uh, CMS scores. These are um, uh, indices of uh, selection at this locus um, for Europeans or Caucasians, for East Asians and for Yoruba. Uh, and so what we can see from this is that there is more evidence for selection among the Yoruba, the West Africans, at this locus than there is for other populations. Um, and so what, do we, what have we learned from this? Again, just looking at this one example of a particular SNP on chromosome 2, um, we see that the risk allele frequency is higher uh, in Africans versus non-Africans. So African populations, on average, have about a 47 percent um, uh, higher uh, risk allele frequency than in non-Africans, that there is some suggestion for positive selection for at this locus in, 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 in Caucasians, in Europeans. And why is that? Well, we went back to this locus and we found that this uh, GWAS hit is adjacent to the gene melanophyllin, MLPH. Uh, and that melanophyllin is involved in pigmentation dilution, meaning that it controls the ability to become less pigmented. Um, and I'm simplifying a little bit, obviously. But what we infer from this is that there is some haplotype that, um, that protects, that, uh, that it contains a melanophyllin gene that is in, associated with pigmentation dilution, the ability to become li lighter pigmented, and that this uh, was uh, selected for among Europeans who had an, an evolutionary advantage by becoming lighter pigmented, but this was not selected for uh, or against in Africans. It just remained static. And so what we infer from this is that the haplotype that protect, protecting against prostate cancer hitchhiked to a very high frequency in Europeans that contained, that had this melanophyllin uh, mutation that allowed them to become less pigmented. So let me just restate what I just said. Based on all of this information, what we can, we can um, uh, infer. So we imagine that there's a locus or a chromosome where there's a pigmentation maintenance allele. And on that same chromosome, there's a prostate cancer risk allele. Another chromosome has this pigmentation dilution allele, that is to say pigmentation you are, uh, allows you to become less pigmented. And that the reference allele, the one not associated with risk, is on that chromosome. And what we can imagine is that, and this is all hypothesis, out of, there was some out of Africa selection pressure for lighter pigmentation. People that moved out of Africa and went to Europe, particularly Northern Europe, became, uh, were allowed to be lighter pigmented but they also carried, uh, selected for the allele with lower prostate cancer risk. Whereas those in, who stayed in Africa 
had a, saw a maintenance of this um, uh, pigmentation and the high risk uh, prostate cancer allele. And that was pre preferentially selected for or remained at high frequency in Africa, maybe not under selection. And so here's just one example where we have a GWAS hit associated with prostate cancer, where we see very different patterns of risk in Africans, African Americans, and Europeans. And maybe one reason that we see those differences because some of these loci underwent uh, hitchhiking uh, for uh, loci nearby that were associated with, um, uh, with uh, some uh, locus under selection. So again, this is all hypothesis. There's a lot that needs to be uh, followed up with that, but I think it gives us a story of the complexity behind um, prostate cancer or cancer or disease susceptibility in general when we think about what's going on in Africans and African Americans and how we begin to understand that. So let me just give you my second example. Um, so the, this is the a second consortium that I'm involved with called the Bridge Consortium. It's a BRCA1 and 2 International Diversity by Geography and Ethnicity. This is a worldwide consortium, and we've broken the consortium up into sort of the Americas, uh, where there are a number of groups studying BRCA1 and 2 in the Americas, particularly in Hispanic populations. We have a group studying BRCA1 and 2 in the Middle East, Mediterranean Middle Eastern groups and as well in Asian groups. I'm going to focus on the African groups, which are really um, at currently in Senegal, Nigeria, Rwanda, and South Africa, where we're studying BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, I'm trying to understand again what is going on um, with interesting patterns of mutational variability in these in the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, how does that relate to risk and uh, prognosis and, um, and other factors in African Americans and other members of the African diaspora? And what can we learn from uh, studying BRCA1 and 2 in an African setting? And I just want to mention that some of this work has gone to um, the United States or Europe for, the, uh, for sequencing, but in Senegal, Rwanda, and South Africa now, there are next-gen uh, sequencing uh, centers. There may even be in Nigeria, although I think the Nigerian data have been uh, generated in the United States, but there are uh, next-gen sequencing facilities and capabilities in Africa that allow us to do this work. And some of this work, in fact, was done and will increasingly be done in Africa itself. So just one brief slide about BRCA1 and BRCA2. These genes are inherited, uh, and I'm going to be talking again about um, germline inherited susceptibility, not somatic genetics, um, to give very high risks of breast and ovarian cancer. So what we see is that breast cancer uh, on average, and this is in European uh, Caucasian populations generally, um, is about 57% lifetime risk for breast cancer in BRCA1, about 50% lifetime risk in BRCA2. Ovarian cancer, about 47% for 40% for, for women who inherited a BRCA1 mutation, and about 18, 20% in women who inherited a BRCA2 mutation. And these genes are also associated with prostate cancer risk and risk of cancer at other loci as well. What you can see here, this is a, a meta-analysis, is just these, these vertical lines are the individual data points that were uh, generated or co collected to get this uh, meta and analytical uh, 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 risk estimate. Um, and you can see there's a lot of variability. Risk tends to increase as you get older, but at each point there's a huge amount of variability. And one of the things we don't know right now is what these risks are in African-American or African descent populations because the data is very small. So we're beginning to try to understand whether the risks that we um, know exist for these um, uh, that were generated in uh, European and Asian populations are really similar to that in African or African-American populations. And the reason this is important is because if you have one of these mutations, there are something you can do to act on that risk. The main thing is to have uh, your ovaries removed, sometimes having healthy breasts removed before um, they develop into cancer. So these are very draconian prevention strategies, but they work. They are, so we have something that we can test people for a uh, risk of, of cancer, and we can in, uh, do something to prevent them from dying of cancer. But we don't really know what the risk profiles are in Africans. And I just point to you, there's a paper that just came out in the Journal of Clinical Oncology this week. Um, from Fumi Olapati's group in Chicago and other collaborators that start to address this. I don't talk about it here, but just came out 
but there is some great work, uh, and that work was done in Nigeria, and it's begun, uh, beginning to uh, give even more information than I can present to you right now, but it's something worth following up on if you're interested in this topic. Let me just say that we have used, um, to give you a sense of where we are uh, with studying African descent populations, the um, Simba Consortium is one of the largest consortiums in the world uh, that accrues data in BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. Uh, as of this last fall, about a year ago, they had 44,000 BRCA1 and mutation carriers in their collection. About 1% of those, uh, less than 1% of those, are in African descent populations. So we're talking about a really limited pool of data right now uh, that address African descent populations. So we're beginning to try to fix that. Um, invite, we invite everybody who may be interested in BRCA1 and 2 um, to uh, join us uh, who have data or have samples or have you know, information that can help us uh, address this problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Caribbean, Europe, or North America who with African descent populations to join our study. Let's just, um, let me just say we've begun to characterize these mutations. We've begun to identify in the Carib in Caribbean, Sub-Saharan African, and African American populations the distribution of BRCA1 mutations, and we identify a few common mutations in um, BRCA1. As you can see, there's one here, a C4357 on G to A. Um, that is uh, probably a common variant in um, African populations in, um, that is not seen uh, in Caucasians. And we've begun to tease out which of the mutations that we see, particularly in um, Caribbean and African populations that are uh, not seen in Caucasians and less, thus likely uh, refer to Afri mutations of African origin. So we're beginning to see a few of those that are really probably African mutations uh, and then carry forward into the new world um, as well. We similarly see some common mutations in BRCA2, some of which are seen uh, both in Caucasians and Africans, some of which are only in African populations, et cetera. But we're beginning to create patterns of the frequency and identify some common mutations, some of which are likely to be founder mutations uh, and commonly occurring, particularly in West Africa, where we have more data right now. We also have done uh, some work recently with that shows that there are regions of the BRCA1 and T2 genes that confer higher risk of breast or ovarian cancer. So we call these regions the BCCR or the breast cancer cluster region or OCCR, the ovarian cancer cluster region. And the BCCR and the OCCR, uh, because they confer different risks of cancer, it's interesting for us to ask, well, do mut mutations that arise in these regions, do they differ? by ethnicity, race, or origin. And what we do see is, in fact, that uh, in B BRCA1 and BCCR, we see that um, African Americans and Afro-Caribbeans have higher rates of this BCCR, whereas um, African Americans have lower rates of the OCCR, and Sub-Saharan Africans have higher rates of the OCCR mutations. So if this can carry through to our to true risk studies, we might be able then to infer, infer that compared to Caucasians, where we have most of the data, African Americans and Caribbean uh, Afro-Caribbean individuals may be at increased risk of breast cancer if they have a BRCA1 mutation, whereas um, if they have an uh, African Americans may have lower risk of ovarian cancer, while Sub-Saharan Africans may have higher risk of ovarian cancer. We need to confirm all of this, but it suggests to us that there are um, genetic differences in the susceptibility to different cancers depending on uh, whether your Afri African ancestry. And so this is something that leads us, uh, supports the notion that there will be differences in risk, differences in frequencies of these mutations, and therefore maybe differences in the way we approach the clinical management of hereditary cancer in, uh, in African descent individuals compared to others. And we don't see the same kind of thing uh, in BRCA2. So there's something maybe different going on in BRCA2 where the, the numbers still remain kind of small, but the, they're not the same kind of patterns as we see in BRCA1. And as I mentioned, we've begun now to take the unique mutations of BRCA1 and BRCA2 where we have um, about 250 unique mutations, and we've begun to identify which of those are likely uh, to be African, probably African, 
uh, cannot determine, etc. And we're beginning to understand which of these mutations are truly African in origin and which are really being identified because they're occurring in admixed populations in the Caribbean or North America. And these mutations really arose in Europe. Uh, and so we're beginning to understand the notion, the distribution of these mutations across African populations. And uh, hopefully now uh, we'll, we've just gotten another uh, download of the data. We have about uh, 300 mutations now that are unique. And so we'll be updating this uh, and continuously doing more of the uh, epidemiological population, evolutionary genetics, et cetera, um, uh, uh, analyses to understand the, the nature of these, whether they are true founder mutations or not. So to end, uh, let me just say, uh, we have begun to take both in prostate cancer and in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, we've begun to do studies of the global distribution of mutations. And based on the initial information, these provide, are beginning to provide insight into cancer etiology that may have value both in understanding the underlying um, etiology of disease, but also clinical translation using this information um, uh, in, a, in a clinical setting or in a public health setting. Uh, for now, most global genetic studies that I'm aware of have limited representation, at least in cancer, have limited representation of minority and particularly African populations. That's certainly true in Simba. And even in our MADCAP group now, we have many thousands of individuals who have participated, uh, but it's still a small number compared to the number of people that are in the large GWAS studies of Europeans, where there are 50 or 100,000 people. So we have work to do. Uh, and there are lots of opportunities for cancer genomics uh, collaborations to be developed. And, and you know, I present to the, the MADCAP and the Bridge Consortium uh, and really welcome your um, uh, participation in any of these if you're interested. Before I end, just let me give a shameless plug to a, a, a symposium we're having in January in Abuja in Nigeria, where these and other kinds of questions will be addressed in prostate cancer. We're planning on having a, a multidisciplinary oncology, clinical research, genomics, epidemiology, and prevention and screening um, symposium, again, on prostate cancer, sponsored by our MADCAP network on January 29th. And so I hope if anybody's interested to contact me, uh, registration is free, uh, and uh, we hope to have a, a nice turnout uh, to, that, to that symposium. So let me end just by say, to acknowledging my uh, colleagues in the MADCAP network and the Bridge Study. Uh, and who who um, contributed to this work? So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. And I'm glad to take questions if anybody would like. Thank you, Professor. Does anyone have any questions? You can raise your hand um, on on the top. Um, there's a bar with a person with a hand. You can either press that or type in the chat where everyone can see your question, and Professor Abe can address it. Go ahead, Victor. Yes, um, thanks for a very, very, very nice talk. I, I really appreciated it. Um, as you, I'm sure you're aware, the vast majority of the of Africans in the Americas, so the Caribbean or North America or South America, for that matter, are from limited regions in West Africa while Sub-Saharan Africa encompasses many more populations. And my question is whether you've seen this reflected in either risk assessments or allele frequency distributions or things like that in the data sets that you've been looking at. Yeah, it's a great question. and. Um, we have uh, observed a couple of things. Uh, you're correct in saying that for North Americans and Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean populations, the majority of individuals came through the transatlantic slave trade through West Africa. And so the majority of the genomes um, contributed to admixture in um, African Americans are West African. But we also see some very interesting um, Central East African, even uh, Middle Eastern uh, genomes. Uh, so as you know, the African populations are also quite admixed, if you will, 
with some uh, Middle Eastern populations having um, shared genomics uh, in African populations. Certain um, populations, uh, there was a, a lot of back and forth during the transatlantic slave trade where populations may have left Africa through Ghana or Senegal or someplace like that, then they, they may have come from very much further afield. And so there was, there, we do see some interesting uh, admixture patterns in our, um, in our genomics when we look at them very closely. Um, but to date, what we haven't been able to do is get really good estimates of risk uh, vari variation um, in African Americans versus Africans because of the limited data. Um, and so our risk assessment ab ability uh, with, with precision uh, has really not gone very far. We, the, the risk assessment that's been done suggests that BRCA1, for example, has been, is certainly associated with increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer, but we don't have good estimates of that. Um, in contrast, in prostate cancer, and this is actually true in many GWAS that I've seen, um, the GWAS associations have not been replicated. Uh, so the, the risk associated with um, certain GWAS hits that are clearly GWAS associations in, um, in European or Asian populations, um, where there's no doubt that these are GWAS uh, hits, um, you don't see uh, the uh, replication all the time of those hits in African American populations where there's where there's admixture and a substantial proportion of African um, chromosomes. And so I think part of the issue is, um, well, what part of the question has been, is there really an, a fundamental underlying difference in the etiology and the genomics of prostate cancer between African, African descent individuals and other populations? And I think Right now, what we think is just that we're not capturing African alleles, and I think that's the initiation of your question. We're not capturing African alleles very well in many of the genomic um, GWAS studies that have been done. Um, and you know, so many uh, GWAS studies use uh, you know, a panel devised for, Af for European populations, and that's just not a good panel for, um, for Africans and African Americans. So, for example, the H3 Africa panel that's been developed and other African-specific panels are really important for us to be able to retype or to do some, redo some of these analyses in African Americans to see whether we pull out some of the, you know, the, the hits that we think should be there but were not captured in earlier studies using non-African panels. Of yeah, it, it does. Uh, thanks very much. I, actually, I think also that, uh, I mean, the haplotypes that are associated m might be different. I mean, the risk factors might still be genetically the same, but the associated SNPs may not be. That's right. Very, very true. And again, to the degree that we're capturing those haplotypes or SNPs that might be important in African populations is really yeah, dependent yeah. on the panels that we use. And I don't, up to date, we have not used Thank you very much. adequate panels. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Victor. Any other questions? You can, again, type it in the chat room or raise your hand. There's um, a hand or a person with a hand on the top panel. Or tab, and you can press that, and I can allow you to ask a question. Thank you. Well, in the absence of any more questions, I will ask logistic, logistical questions to Prof. Rebek. Um, Professor, for the symposium that you advertise that's going to be happening in Nigeria, will there be any travel grants that you're going to offer uh, potential participants or people that are interested? Um, and should they use your Harvard email to get in contact with you? Um, and lastly, in terms of the slides that you just used for yeah. this amazing talk, um, are you okay with me sharing uh, the PDF with the people that are interested in, in getting it? Yes, yeah, yes. So please share the slides with anyone who's interested. Um, there will be some travel grants for this, um, this conference. Uh, we're, there, it will be very few, but there will be some, and um, they're uh, going to be determined by our consortium network people. 
Uh, and so if anybody's interested in learning more, they can email my, my, um, my Harvard uh, uh, email address. The, if, you can, if you want to share that around, that's fine. Um, or I'm glad to give you any additional information. And I'm also glad to share the flyer with your group across the, you know, the H3 Africa group if you want. So whatever I can do to help, let me know. Much. I think I'll share the email. So for everybody who saw the ad, either on Twitter, Facebook, or on email, the email address is in, in the biography. Or otherwise, I can share it in, in here as well. Um, yeah, and please do share the, you can email me the ad and I'll populate it, or rather publicize it um, on our social media and our announce list for anyone who's interested to, to attend. And I think it's going to have a lot of people that might be interested. So I hope you're ready for your inbox to be filled with applications or inquiries. Yep. OK, sure. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to just say thank you so much, Professor, for taking time out to, to give us this talk. And for anyone who has any more questions, please do get in touch with Professor on his email address. And I'm sure he will get back to you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for having me. Thank